Hey Kid Labbers, we are so excited to launch our Spark series. These are five different things that we value at Kid Lab and we try to incorporate in our programming. And so now the team is going to take that Spark method and we're just going to turn all of that into some online content that you can join in and um, share with others as you want to. We would really love for you to send your questions, your kids' drawings, any stories or play ideas over to us at hello at kidlabraleigh.com and we would love to feature you through Instagram. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel and hit the bell button if you want to be notified when we release our new videos. All right, so up first, our STEM learning session today is going to be all about coral reefs. You can find all kinds of ocean themed resources over on Instagram, hashtag KidLabOcean. We want you to tag your play ideas as well so we can share them with others. We have some learning extension ideas on the website, kidlabraleigh.com slash STEM Ocean. And there you're gonna find some learning prompts for kids ages two through 10. All right, I first wanna mention two handy resources that some of you may already have at home. If not, they might be worth purchasing through Amazon or our favorite kids bookshop, Read With Me, giving them a shout out here. Two resources, one, this beautiful oversized book called Animalium and the particular section we're gonna look at is this gorgeous illustrated page on coral reefs. It's just a great backdrop for us as we study this interesting habitat. And then if you've been around Kid Lab long enough, you know that we're pretty obsessed with Julia Rothman's guides. This one, Nature Anatomy, walks us through all kinds of things and there is a couple, there are a couple pages towards the end of the book that are worth noting as we do our ocean study, parts of a jellyfish, identifying different animals, beautiful illustrations, and I think you guys would have a lot of fun. If you don't have this book, you can pick up a copy through the Read With Me online shop. Caregivers, feel free to have your child sit next to you as you watch this video. Let's go ahead and jump in. One of the reasons I love studying um, coral reefs and teaching it at schools is because I personally had the amazing opportunity to go visit um, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia a couple years ago, and it was such a fascinating and inspiring um, opportunity. I wish everyone in the world could do that, or I was somehow Miss Frizzle, and we could all jump on a bus and go visit it ourselves, but we can't, so I'm gonna show you a couple of pictures. The first slide, you're gonna see an older picture of me, yes, on the left, with some friends of mine, and um, the picture on the right is a humphead wrasse, and if you've ever been to um, a reef or really it, most aquariums have this species of fish too. They can get quite large and they're beautiful, more colorful than this picture really shows. Um, and they're pretty docile creatures. So I was able, as I was snorkeling the Great Barrier Reef, I was able to actually touch this humphead wrasse and I had to get a picture of it with my underwater camera. I named him Wally. It felt like a bond. It was special. So we are gonna continue. I just wanted to throw that in there because this is uh, near and dear to my heart, just having that experience. It was um, mind blowing. So I wanna just back up and say, um, if you don't have um, this perspective, it's helpful to know that our world is covered with water. If you look at a globe, three quarters of it is gonna be blue. And coral reefs make up only less than a percent of that and yet it contains about 25% of all ocean creatures. So that means that there are a ton of marine species that are crammed into these small areas of the um, coral reef habitats. You're gonna find coral reefs hugging the coasts of the continents. So if you look at the bottom right hand corner of the map on this slide and you see the orange, you'll notice that it hugs the continents. All the reef systems are gonna be found in the shallow subtropical warmer waters along the coastlines. Reefs are sometimes called the rainforests of the ocean. They are second only to rainforests in terms of biodiversity, tons and tons and tons of animals, 
find their homes in the coral reefs, which is really pretty amazing when you think about how little space they actually occupy in the world's oceans. But my question today is what exactly is a coral? Is it a rock, a plant, or an animal? Any guesses? I am classifying it as a replantimal. I know it's cheesy, don't actually answer that on a test. It's my way of saying that corals are super fascinating because they have rock, plant, and animal characteristics. What in the world? At the end of the day, scientists have classified corals as animals, and that's because they're made up of thousands of tiny polyps, these tiny little organisms, and I'll show you a slide more on that in a minute. But corals, as you might know, are stationary. They don't go anywhere. They are attached to the sea floor. So in that case, it sort of makes it a little bit like a rock, because rocks are stationary, they don't go anywhere. But I'm gonna tell you why it's sort of like a plant as well. But at the end of the day, scientists are classifying it as animals. So how can corals survive if these are animals and animals need food to survive, but corals are stationary like rocks and they can't go anywhere. Well, that's where this plant component comes in. Corals have, at the end of these polyps, there are these stinging tentacles, right? And there's a very, very simple mouth that leads into a very simple stomach, a, a, a very rudimentary, a simplified digestive system, not like most animals that we think of. And then at the base, you're gonna see what's called a basal plate. Think of that a bit like shallow roots or kind of like glue that attaches the coral to the sea floor. So we have this coral that can't go anywhere. It's stuck in one place, but it's an animal with a very simplified mouth and a stomach, which means that it gets hungry and it needs food. Think about us. We're animals, we're humans, but we're animals, and we have mouths and we need food in order to survive, right? That makes us different than a plant. A plant needs what to survive? A plant needs to use the sunlight harvested through a process called photosynthesis, and that is what gives the plant its energy, right? It also pulls up water and nutrients from the soil, so it works both ways from above and from below, and that's what makes a plant a plant. That's how it survives. An animal, in contrast, needs to eat with its mouth and it needs to digest food in its stomach and its digestive system. So a coral sort of fits the bill to be both a rock, because it's stationary, a plant, I'll tell you more about that in a minute, and an animal because it's got that mouth and digestive system. So stick with me for the animal part real quick and then we'll move to the plant part. Think for a minute about a coral that has tentacles that stick out, small, small tentacles that stick out and they're grabbing small micronutrients and little organisms that are floating by in the ocean and is pulling them into their simple mouth and into their digestive system in their stomach. Now think about the fact that they can't move. They can't go anywhere. So do you think if you were a coral and you were just waiting for food to float by so that you could gobble it up and digest it, do you think that you would be fat and happy? Or do you think that if you're just waiting for things to float by, you might kind of starve if left to your own devices? It's a little bit of a both and in the case of coral. There are small organisms that float by that are small enough for them to ingest. And yet, if that was their only source of food, they would not be able to thrive. Enter in this interesting plant characteristic. In this next slide, I wanna show you this really fascinating symbiotic relationship that coral have with another organism called algae. Let me back up and say that symbiosis is a fancy science word and you should know it because it's actually really cool. It just means that two organisms are BFFs. 
And what do you do with your best friend? You share, right? Hopefully. You share your snack or you share the ball when you're playing outside. You want to do things that are helpful and fun with your best friend. In the same way, a symbiotic relationship in nature can benefit both parties. So in the case of coral, having a friendship, a symbiotic buddy-buddy friendship with algae, both coral and algae need to benefit. If it's truly going to be a symbiotic friendship, both need to benefit. Now stay with me. Algae is everywhere in the ocean. Algae is this really, 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 really small stuff that every ocean animal likes to gobble up whether they want to or not because it's everywhere. Algae is actually plant-like. It grows by harvesting sunlight through this process of photosynthesis. Now, think about what I said about coral. Coral don't have a very consistent food source, do they? Remember, they're kind of like a rock. They stay there, planted, they're stationary at the sea floor. Algae are floating around and they get gobbled up by just about every other marine animal that there is. So algae's main concern is getting protection. Algae really, really needs shelter. What does coral need more than anything else? Food. So here's what happens, friends. This buddy-buddy symbiotic relationship between coral and algae is fascinating. Coral needs food? Guess what? Algae has a lot of it and it shares its food and its nutrients with the coral. And in return, the coral gives algae exactly what it needs more than anything else, protection. It hides itself inside of the coral. So in this way, the coral benefits because it has a steady stream of food and the algae benefits because it's protected. If none of this is making sense, don't worry, it's okay. But for those of you that are a little bit older and you wanna research this symbiotic relationship, I highly recommend it. It is one of the most fascinating ones in nature. One of the other cool things to note about what algae gives to coral, other than its food, is it actually gives the coral its color. So if you've ever seen images of corals or if you've watched Finding Nemo and you've seen all those bright, bold colors, know that the biggest reason it's colorful is because of the algae that's tucked inside of it. Super fascinating to study algae inside coral. One other thing to note about algae that's important here is that algae is really, really picky. It is extremely temperamental in so many ways, especially when it comes to the water temperature that it's in. And we all know, or we should know, that there's this global phenomenon happening called global warming. It's something that we all need to take seriously. And we also know that with global warming comes a rising temperature of our oceans. With the increase in temperature of our ocean waters, the algae is leaving which leaves the coral to starve without that main source of food help that's coming from the algae. It's also turning this ghost white. If you look at images here, you can see it's a process called coral bleaching, and it's a telltale sign that the coral reef system is dying. It's not getting the nutrients it needs from the algae, and it's losing the color as well. This is happening to our reef systems across the globe and it is sad and devastating. This will have long-term impacts on all of us if we're not careful and we don't take steps to actually decrease our carbon footprint. If we don't take steps to use more sustainable fishing practices, do things like reducing waste, recycling, or reusing whenever possible. All of these things will impact the coral reef habitat that we know and love. Think about those earlier pictures when I told you that 25% of all ocean animals call the coral reef their home. What will happen to them and where will they go when their home disappears? That brings us to our project today. 
This is one of my very favorite projects to do with kids in nearby schools for the main reason of it gets kids to think about recycling and reusing materials. What I wanna show you today is how to recreate this at home using simple things that you might already have. So let's make our very own coral reef biome. For this project, I'm gonna encourage you to find a box. It could be as big or as small as you want and round up all kinds of recycled materials that look interesting to you. You're probably gonna want scissors, tape, glue, or if you're with an adult, you'll want a hot glue gun. That was my personal favorite for this project. Here are a few things that you might try to recreate at home. So if you've got small cups or even egg cartons that you can glue together, Maybe you wanna color them brown. You could start to make something that looks a bit like barnacles. If you have coffee filters or cupcake liners, you can use markers and spray them with water. Let them dry and you get this really beautiful watercolor effect. And if you start to fold them together a bit like this, and glue them or staple them together, you get what I think looks a bit like brain coral. And then if you happen to have some medical gloves at home, I filled these with um, tissue paper. You could fill them with scrap paper as well. When you put these together, I think these start to look a bit like sea anemones. Another thing you could do with cups is piecing some together to look a bit like lobe coral. In this case, I use snow cone cups and it would be fun to actually decorate the inside of them to give them color. If you had straws and pipe cleaners, you could create something that looks a bit like a sea sponge like this. Or if you've got toilet paper rolls, which we all should have, you can recreate a larger version of sea sponges as well. These are really fun to paint on or use those paint sticks I was telling you about. These are one of my personal favorites if you have pipe cleaners. And what you can do is create sea fans by starting to twist them together. And these can get really big or small to be part of your biome. If you happen to have a styrofoam ball or even Play-Doh at home and some toothpicks, or if you don't wanna get as pokey, you're worried about the little ones, then you could also use um, straws. I recommend making a sea urchin. These are super fun. If your kids are like mine and you go through applesauce and fruit cups by the dozen a day, it seems like, then you might have a lot of these. These um, are great for creating jellyfish with ribbon scraps. And then these are what I call fillers. I just think these are super fun and look a lot like corals. I don't even know why, but they do. So I recommend just looking around the house to see what kinds of cool, funky, recycled materials that you might have, and then just try it. Find things that are colorful and things that remind you of this amazing habitat. I hope you guys have a lot of fun. Be sure to take pictures of all of your creations. Tag us and look up the hashtag KidLabOcean for more play ideas for this unit.